Hi, welcome to On the Fly, the show that takes you to local fly fishing destinations. I'm your host, Lee Smith. For many of us that fish for trout, we know about the conservation efforts of Trout Unlimited, and many of us are members. If you're not familiar, Trout Unlimited is an outdoor conservation organization that's about 55 years old. TU works to keep the country's cold water fisheries and their watersheds safe from environmental threats for all to enjoy. TU is guided by the principle that if we take care of the fish, the fishing will take care of itself. There are about 150,000 Trout Unlimited members across the U.S. and about 400 chapters nationwide. Tonight my guest is Tony Hill, president of the Mianus chapter of Trout Unlimited in Connecticut. Tony, thanks for coming. Thanks for would having you, me. Would you start off by telling us a little bit about the history of the Mianus chapter? Sure. Um, Mianus chapter was founded in 1972. A group of local anglers had seen what Trout Unlimited was doing uh, in the rest of the country and realized we didn't have anyone here looking to take care of our streams. So they got together and got a charter from the national organization, started the local group. Very good. Can you tell me a little bit about what the chapter looks like today as far as number of members, your meetings, and, and so forth? Sure. We have nearly 650 members. We, the Mianus chapter covers the towns of Greenwich, Stamford, Norwalk, Darien, New Canaan, and Wilton in Connecticut. Um, there are eight chapters in the state of Connecticut, and ours is in the southwest corner, and we take care of primarily the Norwalk River and the Mianus River. Very good, very good. Um, I know that, that you know, there are major events for each chapter during the year, and I know you've, you've brought some slides with you today. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind walking us through uh, some of the, the uh, slides for each of the events that, that take place over the course of the year. Certainly. This is our, one of the things our chapter does is gets a fishing trip out every month. This is our New Year's Day trip and that was on the Mianus River and Mianus River Park in Stamford. Right. And how'd they do that? Do you remember how they did that day? The Mianus? coffee and donuts were very good. <laughs> uh, just a couple of fish were caught. Okay. And there we go. And where is that one from? That's the west branch of the Delaware River. We do a trip in July. It's a, a weekend trip. We go up and rent a bunch of cabins and go out and spend the, uh, the weekend fishing there. All right, and about how many members usually show up for that type of outing? On the weekend trip, we're limited to 24 uh, for the space that the cabins will sleep. Okay. On some of our other trips, we could have anywhere from New Year's Day, we actually had 30 people out in the cold. Um, oh our best trip, we had uh, over 40 people on the Housatonic River last year um, for a bass fishing trip. Okay. Uh, typically, we could get uh, 20 to 30 people on any of our trips. That's great. That's a great turnout. And what's the, uh, the next one that you have here? This is, I mentioned, our bass fishing trip. We uh, happened just last weekend, in fact. There's a smallmouth bass caught up in New Milford on the Housatonic River. Um, okay. And I believe you have uh, one more that you brought with you as well. Yes. Part of the bass fishing trip afterwards we go over to local restaurants is having their bratwurst festival. Part of the reason we, we have our trips is to get people engaged, to get people to meet other fishermen, give folks a fun thing to do. So going out fishing for the smallmouth bass and then going out for the beer and brats afterwards is a fun And so do the have. fish get larger as you have more beers typically? Absolutely. Is that, okay. And, and yeah. way more were caught. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I noticed that when I, when I looked at your, your, uh, your website, myanistu.org, that you actually, uh, as a chapter, sponsor a number of different rivers, um, which is a little bit unusual because I know most really focus on one or two. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping that, that what we might be able to do tonight is have you give us a little more insight on a couple of those rivers, a uh, little on the size, best times of year to fish, and, and I see you've brought, uh, brought some flies here with you as well. Sure. Um, the our namesake river, the Mianus River, runs um, from New York down to the Sound. The best spot to fish it is in Mianus River Park, which is in Stamford, right okay. on the Stamford Greenwich border. You've got a 250 acre park with a river running through the middle of it. Best times to fish it are fall, winter, and spring. During the summer, the river does get a little bit lower, a little bit warmer. Okay. Depending on what sort of rain and what sort of temperatures we've had, would uh, determine whether or not you want to go in the middle of the summer. And this is pretty well stocked too as well, right? It's, yes, stocked twice a year by the state. Okay, all right. 
And so can you tell us a little bit, I know you brought some flies, can you sure. tell us a little bit more about what sort of flies, and maybe even if you can tell us the, the times a year uh, to use the various flies, that'd be great. Okay. The Mayanis has a great stonefly hatch, and here's a stonefly nymph, which is a subsurface fly. Um, most fish are caught on nymphs. And then we also have some of the adult fly. This is a dry fly that would float on top of the water. So when you're fishing, you'd see a fish coming up and surfacing and taking a fly. And this is what we're trying to coax him into eating. And watching a fish come up with a big splashy take and sure. gets real exciting when you see that. Um, and then also just another small one that we use in the winter. It's called a Griffith's gnat. Uh, that's a size 18. And those are the main flies that, that we would use on the, uh, on the Mayanis. Also, okay. caddis flies on most of the rivers in the area um, are an important fly to use. Okay. We have... And is there a t special time of year for the caddis fly, or is it year-round? There are different types of caddis flies that hatch different parts of the year. So you, can, you should have some with you at any time of year that you go out. Gotcha. Um, and just a sample of a beadhead caddis nymph. Again, this is a subsurface fly. And that's a weighted head it's on the beadhead. It's got a beadhead bead on so, it. So that helps to get it down in, in, the, in the water column, if you would. Yes, and yeah. then this is the dry fly version of it, an elk hair caddis. Um, okay. And then the Norwalk River, I believe, mm -hmm. is, the, is the other. Can you tell us a little bit about, about that river? Sure. The Norwalk River has over 10 miles of fishing access. It basically parallels Route 7 from Norwalk right on up to Ridgefield. Okay. There are loads and loads of places, and if you went to our website, myanistu.org, you can see um, under fishing, local fishing, click on the Norwalk River, and shows you maps and places where you can pull in and park. Okay, so um, it gives you some insight on where the access is for those spots as well. Yes, yes. Deal. And the Norwalk River in Fish's Best um, Spring, there is a great sulfur hatch that happens mid-May. It's generally in late, after, late evening. You go out there after dinner and spend a couple of hours. And what you're looking for, the sulfur dry fly. This is a parachute sulfur merger, it's called. And there'll be hundreds, if not thousands, of these hatching and coming off the surface of the river. And of course, the fish that have been ignoring you for the past two hours are now feeding <laughs> everywhere. OK, great. Right. Let me just ask you, because mm -hmm. we're talking about access, for, for, for folks that haven't uh, fished the Mianus or the Norwalk before, can you give me some insight on how difficult it is to wade? Because I'm assuming most of this is, is accessed by wading and, and not by, by boat or otherwise. Correct, correct. You're, you're, there are a few places in either river where you could fish from the shore. Um, in the Mianus River Park, we've done some work and put in some hardened access where you could actually stand with your feet out of the water. But in most cases, you're wading in the water. That's where the guys, the silly, with the silly waders on that are up to here. Um, the hardest part is some of the areas, there's over, overgrowth with the trees. Okay. So you just have to be careful with your casting. You can't do one of those beautiful, a river runs through it, casts way right. up in the air. And then down, you're doing shorter casts because the fish might just be 10, 12 feet away from you. Right. And let me ask, for those who, who are planning to go out, um, based upon the fact that you can't do a lot of back casting and hero casts and that type of thing, mm -hmm. talk to me a little bit about the, the size rod and reel that you might want to take to, to go fish either one of these rivers, or, or maybe it's different for each. Sure. No, the, for either of the rivers, you would use a rod anywhere from 6 foot 6 to maybe 8 foot. Okay. You would use a three or four weight rod. Um, this, and again, the flies would be dependent on time of year and what's hatching. You can go to the website and get information on what the best flies to use are different times, different times of the year. Great, so you've got a hatch chart on the, on the side as well. Yes. That's great. Well, let me switch gears for a, mem a minute. Um, as long as I've been a, a member of TU, they've always been dedicated to 
education, whether it be about the river, the insects that live in the river, the fish that live in the river, uh, or even fly fishing itself. And I know, once again, you brought some great slides here. I was wondering if we might be able to tee up the, the first slide and have you walk us through some of the various initiatives that, that my NSTU has. Uh... Certainly. This is a release of fish that were grown in tanks in a program called Trout in the Classroom, or TIC. Mm -hmm. We partner with eight different schools in our area. Um, what we do is provide the eggs to the school. Mm -hmm. The kids raise the fish till they're about two and a half inches long. Okay. They learn about clean water. They learn about proper pH balance, and they learn the importance of a clean river. Okay. And then at the end of the cycle, uh, three months later, we organize a release where we go down to the river and put the fish in the river. Oh, that's great. And the, the kids actually are the ones putting the fish in the river. Great. And is there um, certain grades that this is appropriate to, or is it from first through high school? There, we actually do have tanks in every every level of schooling. Okay. okay. Um, late grade school, middle school, probably the most, uh, the best uh, years to do it, but mm -hmm. we have tanks at all different age groups. And if there's a school listening that's not involved with this, how how would they get involved? And a, a teacher or principal that wants to get involved with trout in the classroom, how would they how would they do it? Sure. In in my area, shoot me an email, and I would. Uh, hook you up with the proper person. Um, actually, depending on where they are, they could reach out to me and then I'll let them know who the appropriate person is. Okay. In Westchester and Putnam counties, it would be the Croton Watershed chapter of Trout Unlimited. Okay. So I'd point them to the right person there. Great, great. Let's go to the, the next slide. Okay, this is one of our members who's teaching fly tying. A lot of us tie our own flies instead of just going to the store and, and buying them. Um, and here Byron is teaching a youngster how to tie a fly. Okay. Go out and buy some thread and, and all the different ingredients you need, some feathers and some fur, and learn how to make these different flies. That's great. Now, how many. This is all member-led, I'm guessing. These are all your members that are teaching individuals. Yes. Teaching. And uh, once again, I'll ask the same thing. Any any sort of age range for no. for the tires? Any if anyone who's got the the coordination, the hand-eye coordination, um, I've seen everything from I think an eight-year-old. Um, we have some members that are 90, and eyesight's not quite what it used to be, but sure. it's still tying flies. That's that's great. That's great. It's a great hobby for the winter when right. you can't actually get out and fish. And what and of the different flies that are out there, what, what do you typically teach them how to tie? You almost always start tying something called a woolly bugger, okay. which imitates a, a bait fish or a leech. Okay. Um, easy to tie. And woolly buggers catch a lot of fish. Okay. Whether it be a trout or a smallmouth bass, uh, perch, any any sort of fish. Great. So they can come tie this on and hopefully hopefully take it out that weekend and, and catch and their catch fish, fish on the fly that they, they tied themselves. Yes. That's great. What uh, What's the next slide that, that uh, you brought? This is our casting clinic. Um, what we do is at Merwin Meadow Pond in Welton, we set up around the pond. We have areas for beginners, for intermediate casting. We even have some expert casting instructors. Mm -hmm. Um, in addition to the casting, the, the um, river, the Norwalk River is right there, so we take folks over to the river and we explain to them where, if you were going to fish this stretch of river, how you would approach it, where you would expect the fish to be. Okay. One of the slides also showed um, someone looking at some of the insects, which are the, the actual live insects that the flies we have here are meant to imitate. Okay. And last year, the state of Connecticut came to do a stocking. We were able to arrange that with them. Oh, nice. And so the, the young folks that were there got to actually take a bucket with 18 or 20 inch fish and go down and dump them into the Norwalk River. Oh, great. So I, I'm going to ask a question about the, the casting that I've asked about the others, which is who shows up for these types of things? What are the age ranges of people learning to cast? And, and how do you, hand, you know, I assume once again, this is all your members instructing th these individuals how to cast. Mm -hmm. This year was the first time we did a youth initiative, so we actually had some some uh, kids, first, second graders, um, right on through folks that have decided at a different time in life to uh, try fly fishing. 
Okay. Um, I didn't start until I was in my 40s. Right. Um, so it's something that you could take up at any time. That's great. That's great. And men, women, both you, that you find in them? Men or women, actually, when you first start out, women seem to be able to pick it up quicker. Um, they're e e easier for them to listen to instruction and get the, get the rhythm. Okay. As opposed to talking to a guy who looks at you and says, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> okay. All right. And, you know, these are folks that are beginners. You really, they've had no prior instruction coming out to, to meet with you. I mean, from, the, from someone who's never held a fishing rod in their hand right. to folks that have been spin fishing for a number of years to folks that have done a little bit of fly fishing. We have different people, different experts to work with folks at every level. Okay. At our at our fishing clinic. That's great. Yeah. That's we great. had we had over 100 people last year. Did you morning. really? And that's a, a, a afternoon thing or a couple hours? We or? we start. Uh, it's a morning. We start at uh, nine in the morning. We fish till about noon, and then we actually provide uh, some burgers and dogs for lunch. And then anybody who wants to go back, we were able to time it so that it's on Connecticut's free fishing day, so that even if someone didn't have a fishing license, All they right. could still go in the river and and fish for some of those fish that had just gotten stocked. That's great. So what's, uh, what's the next slide that you have for us? We're doing some river restoration mm -hmm. um, here. Cody's got some bank willow that we're going to be planting uh, along the Norwalk River to help mm -hmm. stabilize the bank. Part of the purpose of planting is to keep the bank from eroding. Also, when they grow up, they provide more shade, mm -hmm. which uh, helps keep the river cool and also provide some protection for the fish. Right. Now this is actually more, uh, as opposed to some of the, the fly tying and fly fishing classes, this is really more of your restoration efforts. And I think that's probably one of the things that most people, at least that are familiar with Trout Unlimited, associated with is it's not, you know, it's not just about the fishing, although the fishing's a great part. The Trout Unlimited chapters really get involved in keeping their, you know, keeping the rivers clean and keeping them up. I know in other parts of the, the country they're actually involved in, in um, removing dams and, and so forth. So uh, I know there's a few few slides on your restoration efforts, and I know they're mm -hmm. pretty broad too. So maybe you could you could walk us through some of those. Sure. Here we're doing uh, some planting up on the uh, Norwalk River, um, and in that case we're planting sycamores. Okay, and is that because that's native to the river, or is that just a, a, a better pl a tree to plant, we, if you will? We, we only try and use native species. In some okay. cases, we go out and we, we do some removal of invasives before we plant something that was native to the area. No deal. And how many planting days a year do you, or those types of things, do you, do you usually have? We generally have a good half dozen uh, planting and, and, uh, and work days. Okay. That's great. Let's go to the next one. Oh, all right. Now, this is interesting. Where, where is this? This is on the Norwalk River in Wilton. Okay. What they have is an old conifer, and we're going to use it to make what we call a conifer revetment. The tree is put along the shore of the river, and it's staked in place. And what happens is, as the water flows by, the branches catch this silt and get it to slow down and then fall to the bottom of the river. Okay. And it keeps the bank from eroding and actually the starts to build back, build the bank back from where it's been eroded. Right. And eventually those conifers get covered over with the with the silt and the mud. That's great. And, and that's... then we follow that up a couple of years later and do a planting behind it. Oh, that's great. So you basically build it up through accretion and then, as you said, you, you, you then plant on top of it as well. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. What's the next one for, for restoration? This is a bypass channel around a little dam. Mm -hmm. This way, um, it's on the Norwalk River. This way the fish can come up and they're not stymied by the dam. They want to f swim further upstream so they can come up, go right around the dam and keep heading on upstream to where their spawning areas are. All right, so how long would a, a project like that take and, and what would be involved in, in putting together? I'm sure you didn't show up with a shovel and just dig it out in, in one day. That probably took a little more than that. Sure, the, the longest part is getting the plan in place, having the engineering done, getting the permits from the state and whatever town or city we're in. Mm -hmm. That could even take a couple of years to get all that done. And do you remember how long it took to prepare for the one you just showed us? That was a, a two-year stretch. That was a two-year stretch. So once again, it's not just you showing up that day. There's input from, from the state as well as to what they're willing to allow you to do. And, and Absolutely. That type of thing. 
Absolutely. Okay. And the funding for, for projects like that one, where does, is that all self-funded? Are there grants involved? We, we have different grants that we apply for, uh, depending on the size of the project. Some of it does come out of our regular budget. Um, our fundraising banquet is, uh, is uh, raising money for that, uh, for the smaller projects. Okay. And then trying to get, and getting grants from uh, different organizations or the state or the federal government. That's great. What's the next one that uh, we brought in here? Wow, that's a lot of that's a lot of trash. This is a cleanup day we had. Um, in about two and a half hours time, we collected all that. You can see the tire. Tires always seem to end up in the river. Mm -hmm. Anytime we have a cleanup, there's pictures of anywhere from one to a half dozen tires. It, a couple of the big storms, the the 500 year storms, which we have every couple of years, it seems now, all mm -hmm. sorts of things get washed into the river. Um, so we go in and clean them out. And how many how many people would would show up for an effort like that? Anywhere from ten to twenty. Okay. And they're picking this all up with their hands, or do you have other equipment that you help to, to extract some of that? We're, we're primarily picking up with our hands. Um, mm -hmm. We do have some different things we use to pick up glass. If we see broken glass, you don't want to reach down and grab that. Um, and then we just haul it out, and the town will take it away for us. Oh, well, that's great. And so, what's the next one we have? Ah, that's great because I think it shows that it's not just for uh, for adults. Is that is that a father son? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that's uh, do you remember what river that might be on? That one was on the um, Mianus River down below the uh, park. Mm-hmm. That's great. All right. And were there any more around uh, there? Ah, oh, there's your tire photo. And so, that's and that's a different year than the other picture. Right so. now, I'm taking those were all pulled from one spot. Yes. Okay. That's amazing. That's amazing. Okay. Um, I think that's all of the, the restoration uh, photos that we have. I do have a question for you, though. I know that there are various initiatives um, that you're also involved with, with other outside organizations, such as Project Healing Waters. Could you tell us a little bit more about what Project Healing Waters is and the, Man the Mayanis TU role in that initiative? Sure. Project Healing Waters is an organization to help um, our veterans returning from, um, from the war. Uh, and in some cases, we actually have some veterans that are uh, outpatients at, say, Montrose VA mm -hmm. uh, that we work with specifically who are um, going there because of the time in the Korean War or Vietnam. Okay. These aren't just young fellows coming back, young folks coming back now. Okay. Um, and what we do is we uh, help them with flight. We set up a fly tying program to uh, sit down and, and work on tying the flies and learning that, that skill. And then afterwards, we, we have a fishing trip mm -hmm. um, to go out and hopefully catch a fish with the fly that they tied. That's great. And I believe you brought some pictures from, from your Project Healing Waters initiatives as well. Mm -hmm. Now, who... This would be a mix of, of volunteers and? And the veterans are in okay. the picture, uh, half and half. Okay. Um, this was actually on the Amawak River in Westchester um, back in the spring. And that day, no one caught any fish. Okay. Uh, neither those of us that have been doing it for 20 years right. or the fellows who had a fly rod in their hand for the very first time. Right. That happens sometimes when you're fishing. Yep, it, it does. And, and how many how many members will typically show up for that and how is how is it arranged is it is it one guest to one member or we we try and have one or two people for each of the uh, each of the veterans um, working with them that's great that's great I think you brought a couple of indoor shots too from that yeah th now this is actually from the the fly tying I'm guessing right yes up at the uh, Montrose VA hospital Montrose VA and what's the turnout been like of, of the actual veterans themselves is it they, uh, Byron has, uh, Byron Roll is our person who runs it. He has um, uh, eight to 12 people at, uh, on a regular basis right. that come and, and he builds on the skills. The, the first time you do some ba very basic things and then slowly build the fly tying skills uh, each subsequent. Uh, and do you start visit. them off with the woolly boogers too? Like Absolutely. You did? All right, great. Absolutely. All right. And do we have, have any. Um, any other photos from the? Yeah, I think there's there's another one, uh, you, and you can tell how how pleased they are with what uh, what what they've done there. That's that's great, and they'll have an opportunity after that to take the fly out, as you said, on the water if they they'd like to and fish it that day. 
That's that's great. Um, I've asked you a lot of you know, a lot of questions. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about the 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 chapter um, as you know, as far as contacts, meetings, that type of thing? I'll uh, I'll get your your final contact info in just a second. But sure. Anything else you'd like to share? Um, well, our our website does have a lot of information on it. As I mentioned, um, telling you where local fishing, where to go for local fishing, mm -hmm. uh, all our upcoming events, um, our annual banquet. Uh, we had 150 people last year at, the, at our big fundraiser. That's great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and the other different things that happen, we have meetings once a month, uh, second Tuesday of each month from September through April. We'll have a speaker come in and talk about either local fishing or maybe um, how to uh, rig up a rod and what flies you would use for a trip to maybe Argentina or Montana. Uh, or someone will come in and talk about fishing the salt water, since we're right on Long Island Sound, um, or going up to the Catskills. We bring in different speakers to talk about things that we hope will interest our, uh, our members. That's great. Tony, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you. Uh, before, before we close out the show, let me give you some contact information. If you're interested in finding out more, the website is Mianus, that's M-I-A-N-U-S, tu.org. I know they're also on Facebook. And if you're looking to co connect with uh, Tony directly, his email is thill at myanistu.org. I'd like to thank my guest again, Tony Hill, president of Myanist TU, uh, for giving us some great insight on the Myanist chapter. I want to thank the crew for making us all look good, and thank you for watching on the fly. <laughs>